Welcome to this week's episode of Fry Brain Science. I'm your host, Dr. Brian Fry. As always, please like and subscribe. Last week, we talked about options of what to have done with your body after you die. This week, we'll be talking about some animals that produce some of the bodies. This episode will cover 10 dangerously venomous animals. As such, of course, you know, any list is inherently subjective. In reality, the most dangerous animal is the one that just envenomated you. This episode will work its way through the most dangerous within major types of venomous animals, spanning invertebrates to vertebrates. Within each of the groups, the one nominated as the most venomous is not simply which is the most toxic, but that which has the greatest impact upon human health. This, of course, is a combination of raw toxicity, how much venom is injected, what the likelihood of a bite is, how fast the venom acts, and whether or not an antivenom is available. Hence, the dangerous part of the episode description. For each of the groups, the nominated as most dangerous will be of a type, rather than a particular species. This is so we don't have to split taxonomical hairs, or scales, as the case may be. This is because the splitting up into individual species is often quite arbitrary in the distinctions between closely related animals occupying the same niche, and in the case of venomous animals, with highly similar venoms. Now, not all of these animals have been treated equally across the different groups. Some have been enthusiastically split into an perhaps excessive number of species, while others have been lumped into a few taxonomical dumping ground species located in the too hard file. So two cobras, for example, that can only be distinguished by the number of butt scales are treated as a single kind for the purpose of this episode. This will allow them to be ranked relative to a type of viper that also contains closely related species only differentiated by butt scales. So as an example, all the funnel web spiders will be placed together, allowing them to be compared to all the black widow type spiders to determine which is the most dangerous kind of spider, not the individual species of funnel web. Let's start with a bit of housekeeping. Venomous animals differ from poisonous animals in several important ways. First, while most poisonous animals accumulate their toxins from their diet, although some do make it, venomous animals all make their own toxins, with one or two exceptions. Poisonous animals deliver their toxins in a passive way. These are tiny toxins that easily absorb across the skin when they are touched or the mouth or the stomach when they are eaten. In contrast, venoms typically contain very bulky protein-based toxins that are far too large to absorb through the skin, being up to 1,000 times the size of the toxins in poisonous animals. Therefore, the only way a venomous animal is going to get them into the body is by creating a wound for them to enter through. This typically large size also restricts the spread of venoms in the body to the parts reachable by the bloodstream. They usually can't enter the central nervous system or cross the blood-brain barrier. This aggressive requirement to create a wound is therefore the fundamental difference between a venomous and poisonous animal. Within venomous animals, the delivery mechanisms have evolved independently every time venom has evolved across these various lineages, using ordinary pre-existing teeth to completely new and wild structures like the harpoon of a cone snail. Poisonous animals are another distinction in that they use their toxins only for defense, while venomous animals may use it for predation, defense, or a combination thereof. The toxins themselves in venomous animals are usually weaponized versions of proteins that are normally secreted elsewhere in the body for a completely ordinary type of use. For example, what makes a taipan venom so insanely dangerous is that it's loaded with weaponized versions of two blood clotting factors, factor 10A and factor 5A. When injected, these cause an out of control activation of the blood clotting cascade. No different than if someone gave us a normal humanized version through an IV as a massive overdose. Similarly, the classic neurotoxins in elapid snakes like corals cobras or death adders, they cause a lethal paralysis through the use of a weaponized version of a brain neuropeptide. 
All right, now let's get started with this episode's 10 Dangerously Venomous Animals. First up are mammals. We don't normally think of mammals when we're talking about venomous animals, but venom has in fact evolved multiple times within mammals. There's a myriad of venomous mammals out there like the European water shrew, vampire bats, and even a venomous primate called the slow loris. These three lineages represent the full range of venom uses. Shrews having a predatory venom, vampire bats having venoms that increase the blood flow at the feeding site and also block blood clotting, and slow lorises having intensely painful defensive venoms. But none of these are our most venomous mammal. The champ, due to its extraordinarily painful venom, is the Australian platypus. The platypus is a seriously weird animal at every trophic level. Despite being a mammal, the platypus lays eggs. It also has a body temperature that is not only the lowest of all mammals, but it's not a constant like ours is. It can vary several degrees depending on how warm the air or water is around it, which would have us overheating or shivering uncontrollably. To add to this list of odd characteristics, the male platypus is one of the few mammals that produces venom. This venom is secreted on spurs in the hind legs and is only produced by males during the breeding season. The venom is not only one of the most painful mammal venoms, but it's also one of the most painful venoms in the world. The males are using it during the breeding season to fight other males for territory and, of course, females, stabbing each other over and over to show off to the females. Reason number 729 of why the females of any species live longer. Humans that try to pick them up are stabbed repeatedly by the spurs located on the back legs and endure hours or even days of excruciating pain. War veterans who have been stung describe it as more painful than being shot with a bullet. To make it worse, the pain also doesn't respond well even to powerful painkillers like morphine. Because platypus stings on humans are very rare, no specific treatment has been developed to alleviate this discomfort. So while the venom won't kill you, it'll put you in enough pain that you might wish to just die to end it. Our second venomous animal is the blue ring octopus. When people think of octopus venoms, their thoughts typically go right to the blue ring octopus. And this is due to the common misconception that this is the only type of venomous octopus. While it is indeed the most toxic octopus, no spoiler there, did you know it's not actually the only octopus with venom? In fact, all octopuses are venomous. If you go diving anywhere in the world, you'll often find clamshells open and empty. If you look closely, many times you'll find a circular hole on the side of the shell. This is where an octopus using a special structure called a radular tooth has drilled through the side and injected venom into the clam. All octopus venoms contain a myriad of different components they made themselves, including paralytic neurotoxins that relax the clam's muscles, allowing the octopus to pry open the shell. Venom in octopuses is produced by a large pair of flat, disc-like venom glands located up in the mantle, their head, of the octopus. It's then delivered by the beak located in between all the arms of the octopus underneath. Interestingly, there is an inverse relationship between the size of the venom glands and the size of the beak. Those with big beaks have small venom glands typically, indicating that the octopus uses the beak as the primary weapon for prey capture. Conversely, those with big venom glands have small beaks, indicating the reverse, that the venom glands are the primary prey capture weapon. Most octopuses are totally harmless to humans with their venoms evolutionarily selected to be potent on animals super unrelated to us, like clams and lobster. So at most, a person will typically only get a swollen hand. Most octopuses are stealthy, active only at night, and during the day they hide away in the rocks or rely on their amazing camouflage. However, the blue ring octopus brazenly strides across the Australian tide pools during the bright of the day. As a general rule, any time you see a brightly colored, soft-bodied animal being conspicuous, they're usually able to back it up with a chemical form of Krav Maga. This is because, in addition to the toxins they produce themselves, 
like other octopuses. Blue rings are unique in having symbiotic bacteria living within them that produces tetrodotoxins, one of the most powerful natural neurotoxins in the world that has a very broad range of activities, being active on invertebrates through to vertebrates such as ourselves. And it's also a very small toxin. So this means that the blue ring octopus is venomous if it bites you and injects the tetrodotoxin, but it's also poisonous where if you try to eat it, you'll die because the tetrodotoxin absorbs through you. So they're using tetrodotoxin as both a predatory and a defensive weapon. This toxin blocks sodium channels on the nerves. And like getting the wrong key stuck in a door, the channels are left closed, making nerve conduction impossible, leading to lethal paralysis with death from respiratory failure. To add insult to injury, there is no antivenom or antitoxin. And because the bite is very small, most people don't realize they've been envenomated until symptoms appear. By then, the trouble is well underway. If you're unfortunate enough to be bitten, tetrodotoxin is a very threat to your continued survival. Once injected, tetrodotoxin leads to a complete paralysis of the voluntary muscles, including those necessary for breathing. And because these deadly effects can arrive just after a bite within minutes, the victim can be in real trouble and require artificial respiration. However, if the breathing can be maintained, the body will slowly break down the tetrodotoxin, and if the patient can survive the first 24 hours, a full recovery can be expected. In a rather sinister twist, the bitten individual will remain fully aware of their surroundings, even as the paralysis progresses to complete locked-in syndrome. There was a famous case in Australia of a young woman in the tw low 20s who was bitten by a blue ring octopus while having a day at the beach. The ambulance drivers made some rather crude comments about her anatomy that she heard but wasn't able to react to at the time. They thought she was unconscious, she was just unable to move. And they got a real earful once she was able to talk again though. This is why in the case of envenomation, or actually any injury for that matter, that even if the person appears to be completely unconscious, talk to them. They may actually be conscious or unable to move. Many cases of people in comas, recounting conversations of people having around them, or a car accident victim seemingly unconscious, but conscious. So reassure the patient, even if you don't think they can hear you, they might be able to, such as in the case of a blue ring octopus. Up in third are our venomous lizards, such as the beaded lizard we're obtaining venom from here using our specialized, highly innovative technique based upon leading edge equipment. So what we're going to do is milk this beaded, come on darling, pop it mouth open. easiest way to milk them is have them bite down on something and then as they start chewing they'll secrete out the venom and it absolutely just starts flowing. All right, so he's, he's biting now, so that's good. The way they deliver their venom is that they bite and they hang on and sit there and chew and chew and chew and chew. Sometimes they'll even flip onto their back while they're chewing, but they don't let go. They're like little bulldogs. So it's a very different attack strategy than a Komodo dragon. You can see all the drops of venom on the parafil. Actually quite a good little yield at this one. However, there's a lot more venomous lizards out there than have been historically thought. For the longest time, only the helodermatid lizards, beaded lizards and gila monsters, were thought to be venomous. However, our research has shown there's a lot more venomous lizards out there. A few hundred, in fact. All of these are located within a group of related lizards called the Anguiomorpha lizards, which includes the gila monster and the iconic Komodo dragon. This also includes the extinct giant Megalania, 
and a relative of the Komodo dragon in Australia that reached an estimated seven meters in length, which would make it the largest venomous animal to have ever lived. Now, venom and lizards evolved from the same ancestral starting substrate as snakes. The last common ancestor of the reptile clade Toxicophera was unique in having protein-secreting glands on the upper and lower jaws. This doesn't mean that the last common ancestor was venomous per se, that evolution doesn't sort of go in a quantum binary leap, rather there's a squishy, controversial middle, but rather that this is where the reptile venom singularity occurred. From there, lizards and snakes took totally different evolutionary paths, with lizards developing the glands on each side of the lower jaw into proper venom glands, while snakes did the reverse, developing the glands on each side of the upper jaw into proper venom glands. In anguiomorpha lizards, the basal condition is a gland that's made up by multiple small compartments, one per tooth, so about 16 on a side, 32 in total. This form is retained in alligator lizards from the Americas, but then it got a bit more interesting. On two independent occasions, a bunch of these little compartments were fused together to make several big compartments. And this was paralleled by the gland becoming bigger yet again in each of these convergent cases. This was accompanied by a hollowing out of the gland to form a venom storage structure called a lumen, with this super gland now able to make and store more venom. So this happened once in the last common ancestor of the helodermatid lizards, your baited lizards and gila monster, and then happened independently in the last common ancestor of your varanoid lizards, which are your Borneo earless monitor and your monitor lizards. Now, what's really interesting is that in both cases, they convergently ended up with the same number of big compartments, six. In each case, there is a large circular lumen in the, each of the remaining compartments, able to store appreciable amounts of venom, such as over 200 milligrams in the case of a Komodo dragon. Now, paralleling the changes in the venom gland were changes in the venom. The ancestral version of anguiomorph lizard venom is to be rich in a type of serine protease enzyme called a calocrine, which is a trait shared with snakes, reflective of the common history of the glands. Now, these enzymes are multifunctional. They're able to exert diverse toxic effects, such as the destruction of the essential blood clot component fibrinogen, creating an anticoagulant state, through to being able to drop blood pressure like a stone by cleaving a component called kininogen and release potent hypotensive peptides called bradykinins. However, the venom within the monitor lizards is evolving at a particularly fast rate, with the venom between different species of monitors as different from each other as would be the case between equally related snakes, showing that monitor lizard is, venom is actively evolving under a positive selection pressure. But if we step back a little bit further into the last common ancestor of our helodermatids and our varanids, that in our basal venom, we have the emergence of powerful neurotoxins. We've recently published on these. If you go to my webpage, venomdoc.com, select the lab publications section from the um, drop-down menu, all of our papers are in there. It's beyond the scope of this segment to go into full detail of the evolution of the lizard venom system, but I'll be doing a future episode just on lizard venom, so please stay tuned for that if it's something that interests you. Now, to round up this episode, we'll conclude with stating that, based on the current research, the most toxic lizards are the helodermatids. Now, beaded lizards have a larger venom yield, and it appears the Gila monsters in some assays are a bit more toxic, therefore offsetting it, so we would rate them as equally dangerous. Human deaths have occurred, but they are few and far between because these are very rare lizards and therefore bites don't happen very often and often they're just short contact bites, not a long, prolong, you know, prolonged chew. And they don't deliver the venom as quickly as a snake, which has hollow syringe-like fangs. There is, however, no antivenom. But like many other venomous animals, they've been a source of new therapeutic drugs. In the case of the helodermatids, the development of a blockbuster treatment for diabetes using a component called Baeta. Now, this reinforces that we need to conserve all of nature because we can't predict where the next wonder drug is going to come from. So here we have a diabetes treatment from a critically endangered group of lizards, underscoring that if we lose these kinds of animals, we lose future 
life-saving and money-making drugs. Our third dangerously venomous animal type are snails. Yes, you heard that right. There are snails out there with venom, some of which are lethal. In particular are the cone snails, a large family of predatory sea-dwelling mollusks comprising of about 700 species, many of which wear attractively patterned shells. This enchanting outerwear tempts the occasional diver to pick them up, an instantly regrettable decision. The snail's venom-delivering harpoon is so sharp and hits with such force it's capable of piercing a wetsuit. Cone snails evolved their venoms initially for hunting worms and other snails. The majority of cone snails retain this ancestral venom type, which is only weakly potent to vertebrates such as ourselves. However, on at least two independent occasions, cone snails evolved some of their venom to act on fish as a defensive response to fish trying to eat the snails. My lab showed, and others have as well, that they're able to switch between the predatory venom and the defensive venom, so they can switch between a invertebrate acting and a vertebrate acting venom within seconds and back again, which is absolutely extraordinary. So this fish acting vertebrate specific venom type initially evolved as a defensive weapon, but unlike most defensive weapons, it was lethal. So while it solved the problem of being harassed by little fish, it also gave an unexpected opportunity to dine out on a new prey item. So in some of these dual acting venom cone snails, the species stopped feeding on worms and other snails and instead took advantage of this new weapon to become fish specialists. And then eventually they evolved to produce just the one venom phenotype. And these are the ones that are dangerous to humans with deaths on record from these fast-acting neurotoxic venoms. In particular is the geographer cone snail of Australia, which is the, by far the most dangerous and has been responsible for most of the deaths. There is no anti-venom. You either survive or you don't. Because of the venom's swift action and high specificity to individual nerve receptor types, it sparked much interest from pharmaceutical researchers as a rich source for novel compounds for use in drug design and development. And in fact, this has led to the development of the drug ziconotide, a non-addictive painkiller that's about 1,000 times stronger than morphine. It's used for intractable pain such as bone cancer. It does, however, have one great limitation. Since the toxin type that's useful is a protein, like other proteins, it's too large to be absorbed, so it can't be put in as a patch or in a pill. This means it has to be given as an injection, which by itself would limit the market but not be too bad. But the real problem is that the target for this toxin that kills the pain is locked away inside the central nervous system, which, as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, venom toxins are too big to absorb into the CNS. This is because our spinal cord and brain are protected by a thick membrane that is tightly regulated in regards to what can pass through it. And the venom peptides are too large to pass on their own, and the Gandalfs in the body recognize it as something foreign and says, you shall not pass. So the only way that it can be delivered to be therapeutically useful is by a surgically implanted pump that delivers it straight to the spinal cord. Obviously, this greatly limits the market to only the cases where nothing else works. An extreme measure for extreme cases. Scientists have tried for over 20 years to make a small molecule version that can be in a pill and absorbed through the stomach and be so tiny as to cross through the blood-brain barrier, but without success to date, with the huge and continuing effort ongoing, but nothing has paid off. However, because it's such a useful toxin and such a useful compound, if they can make a small molecule version that can absorb, it'll be huge and it'll be an absolute blockbuster drug worth billions. Next up at five, we have fish. Venom has evolved more times in fish than any other lineage of vertebrates on at least a dozen occasions and possibly more. There's even venomous sharks. This is because an early trait of fish is to have sharp spines in front of the dorsal fins to mechanically defend themselves with. Having a bit of painful venom coating this reinforces the lesson. 
And extreme pain is the consistent theme that has evolved over and over again in fish, as anyone who's ever tried to take a catfish off a fishing line has quickly learned. Stingrays are the fish that perhaps sting the most people and likely have the greatest medical impact globally. However, deaths like that of Steve Irwin are quite rare. That, you know, that case is a good example of a typical fatality involving a stingray where the cause of death was due to the mechanical damage from the bob rather than the venom itself. Stingray bombs are deeply serrated, so they go in easily, but as they come out, they grab onto the flesh, leaving a very jagged, torn wound behind. So most stingray deaths are due to blood loss from the mechanical damage. There have been, however, some deaths that certainly appear to be due to direct venom effects, such as paralysis from neurotoxins. And indeed, we've shown in my lab's research that some stingray venoms are indeed potently neurotoxic. But you're very likely to survive a stingray envenomation. It's just going to be a really sucky experience. Having been stung three times by stingrays in the course of my research, I can attest to how painful they are. Indeed, other than the time I broke my back in three places, the most pain I've ever been in was the first time I got stung by a stingray, and it drove its spine into the meaty part of my thigh. It was a big ray, too, so the bob just kept going until it hit bone. The pain was instantaneous and blinding. They need to be renamed. It didn't sting. That's far too benign of a description. No, it hurt like a white-hot poker that it was dipped in battery acid and then shoved into my leg. They really should be called the give me a gun so I can kill myself ray. However, as awful as stingray are, they aren't the most dangerously venomous fish. The most dangerously venomous fish are the stonefish. The venom is even more painful. It's so painful that stung fishermen have cut their fingers off to try to stop the pain. In fact, it's so painful that just the pain alone can kill you, where you're in so much pain that your body goes into shock and you die. But if you survive the pain, then about 20 minutes later, the venom itself can kill you by cardiovascular collapse. They have 13 dorsal spines, and penetration by only one or two is enough to kill you. An antivenom is available if you survive long enough to reach the hospital. However, the venom of stonefish and other fish have an Achilles heel. The very instability that makes fish venom such a nightmare to work on also makes it an easy first aid trick. For all fish stings, the first aid is to immerse the stung part into hot water. Because the fish toxins are extremely large and unstable proteins that readily unfold when heated, much like an egg white turning from clear to white when you cook it. The key, however, is that the water doesn't have to be too hot to work. Only about 50 degrees C or 130 Fahrenheit is enough. However, the pain of scalding yourself with hot water is much less than the pain of the venom. So the water temperature absolutely has to be checked by someone who is not in the throes of this blinding pain because they can't distinguish between water that's hot enough and water that's too hot. There's actually been cases of people causing severe tissue damage with too hot of water, even to the extent of leading to amputation because they basically cooked their foot. In at number six, we have caterpillars. Caterpillars are a remarkable case of repeated and widespread toxic evolution. Not only have poisonous caterpillars evolved on multiple occasions, venomous caterpillars have also evolved on multiple independent occasions. While most venomous caterpillars just cause excruciating pain with their stings, some actually can kill you. My first envenomation was from a saddleback caterpillar when I was living in Alabama as a five-year-old. Being the not-so-very-clever primate that I am, I was attracted to the bright warning coloring rather than it triggering a primal survival instinct to avoid the fluorescently colored soft-bodied animal that was brazenly striding across a leaf in the middle of the day. If I had stopped and asked it whether it knew something I didn't, the answer would have been lots. Instead, I tried to pick it up and had a prompt introduction into the fresh hell that is defensive venom. Saddlebacks only make you suicidal with pain. There is, however, a type of caterpillar that is quite capable of finishing you off themselves. This is the Lonomia caterpillar of Brazil. 
far and away the most lethal type of caterpillar. The venom hits a myriad of sites on the body. As caterpillars have evolved venom for a defense, it's intensely painful like other defensive venoms. However, it also absolutely hammers your blood clotting cascade, leading to bleeding to death as if you were bitten by a venomous snake. It's so potent that the Instituto Butantan in Sao Paulo, Brazil, actually makes the only caterpillar antivenom in the world used to treat the over 50,000 people stung each year. Which is just as well since, you know, death by caterpillar is probably the least glorious thing to have on one's tombstone. So it's good that there's a life-saving medication out there. Next up, at Lucky 7, are spiders. Early in their evolutionary history, spiders didn't kill their prey with venom. Instead, they stabbed them to death with long blade-like structures located at the end of their chelicerae. Venom evolved as a secondary adaptation. Of the spiders still alive today, the mesothelae are the most primitive. They evolved just after the evolution of venom. So while they technically are venomous in that they contain tiny little venom glands, the fact that the glands are so small, and in fact, for a long time, they were debated whether or not they were even venomous, they're killing purely by mechanical means. In contrast, of the spiders that have well-developed venom glands, they're divided up into two main divisions, the mygalomorphs and the araniomorphs, which are divided by whether or not their chelicerae swing forwards and back in that primitive way, as we see in the mygalomorphs and the mesothelae, or whether or not they come together, which we see in the more derived araniomorphs. Mygalomorph spiders still look like primitive spiders, with large chelicerae at the end of their big bodies. The chelicerae are big not only because they're used to inflict massive wounds on the prey, but they actually contain the venom glands just above those fang-like structures. Most mygalomorphs might look big and scary, like tarantulas, but the vast majority are of only trivial concern from a human medical perspective. An exception, and there's of course always an exception, are the funnel web spiders of Australia. These are a group of extremely toxic mygalomorph spiders with deaths on record. In fact, they are the only group of consistently medically important mygalomorph spiders. Within these, the Sydney funnel web is the most medically important simply because it bites the most people due to its concentration in a heavily populated part of Australia. However, it's not the largest, which is the northern tree-dwelling funnel web spider, or the most toxic, which is the southern tree-dwelling funnel web spider. Funnel web spiders have a peculiar and quite fascinating sexual and age-related difference in the venom. Females of any age and juvenile males rarely venture very far from the safety of their burrow, and so they're largely using their venom just for killing their insect prey. So therefore, their venom is highly insect selective, and as a result, females and juvenile males are not particularly dangerous to humans. In contrast, when males become sexually mature, they stop feeding, and they leave their burrows in search of females to mate with. At this point in time, they are now exposed to vertebrate predators. Evolution, consequently, has selected their venom to change at this point in time from the insect-selective predatory venom to a vertebrate-selective defensive venom. Humans are unusually sensitive to this venom compared to other mammals. This is just an unfortunate fluke, as there were no primates in Australia at the time that funnel web spiders were evolving. However, since the ingenious development of a very clever antivenom by Australian venom research godfather Dr. Strawn Sutherland, there have not been any fatalities. It's a really good antivenom. In contrast to the formidable looking mygalomorph spiders, Arania morph spiders are smaller and much more dainty. These spiders not only have much smaller chelicerae, but they swing together like pinchers. The chelicerae can be smaller and more mobile because the venom glands have migrated from the chelicerae and up into the cephalothorax. In contrast to only one group of mygalomorph spiders being of notable human threat, there are a myriad of araniomorph spiders capable of life-threatening envenomations to humans. These include the black widow spiders from the United States and other related spiders, including the closely related redback spider from Australia, as well as other spiders such as the brown recluse types from across the Americas and the six-eyed sand spider from Southern Africa as some examples. 
However, one type of Arania morph spider is the standout across all other spiders of any type, and these are the South American wandering spiders. Wandering spiders are spiders not only with the most toxic venom, but are also responsible for more severe envenomations annually than any other type of spider. This is because they are extremely common in South America and regularly enter people's house. The venom causes lethal neurotoxicity. There is, however, an excellent anti-venom made by Brazil's world-famous Institutu Butantan. Now, in addition to death, that Phenutria bites, wandering spiders, cause some really strange effects on human males that, well, can be a bit uncomfortable. This is severe priapism, which is an extremely painful erection that lasts hours. Basically, it gives you the kind of stiffy that would allow you to charge through a brick wall. But it hurts. <laughs> the venom is being intensely investigated for the development of a new erection dysfunction medication, but first the researchers need to way, find a way to dial back the intensity and um, get rid of that death part. Part 8. Scorpions. No, not the iconic band from the 80s, but the critters crawling out of shower drains during the tropical wet season. Like spiders, scorpions initially killed through mechanical means. In this case, it was through the use of big crab-like claws. The vast majority of scorpions still use their claws as the primary prey capture weapon, with the stingers at the end of their tails small and delivering only tiny amounts of venom. These scorpions are harmless to humans. However, other scorpions in the Boothidae family now have venom as the primary weapon and have huge stingers at the end of their tails. The claws are thin and used just to hold on to the prey, not crush the prey like more primitive scorpions. Unsurprisingly, the most dangerous scorpions are the ones in the Boothidae family with the massive stingers, which allow them to deliver huge amounts of extremely toxic venom. They are of major medical importance, with millions of people stung each year. The venoms are not only intensely painful, but also directly affect the rhythm of the heart, causing a rapid, irregular heartbeat. When I was stung by a scorpion while conducting research way upriver in the Amazon, it was truly awful. My finger felt like it was in a candle flame. But that wasn't the worst part. The venom was causing my heart to beat about 100 beats in 30 seconds and then pause, no heartbeat at all, for five to six seconds, during which time I would start getting really lightheaded from using up all the oxygen in my brain, then a big burst of heartbeat, then nothing, and so on, for six hours. As we were way up river in a remote region, there was nothing to do but just ride it out. It was absolutely terrifying. Scorpion stings are a huge issue across the world, except for Australia. Our scorpions here are pathetic, one area that we really just fall down. But elsewhere, millions of people are stung annually. You know, there's a number of excellent antivenoms that do a particularly good job of neutralizing some of the envenomations, but not all of them, which leads us to our most dangerous of all scorpions, a species with a particularly appropriate name the Death Stalker. Not only is it considered amongst, if not the most toxic of all scorpions, for enigmatic biochemical reasons, it doesn't raise antibodies very well, so the antivenoms do a pretty poor job of neutralizing the venom. And that, as a such, you know, that they remain virtually untreated in most of the areas, and people just have to ride the bites out and either survive or not. But, as with all the other venomous animals, scorpions have been proven to be of tremendous medical benefit. For example, one of the cytotoxic peptides has a particular affinity for a receptor that just happens to be overexpressed in brain cancer cells. So, some very clever scientists have linked this to a fluorescent marker, which allows the surgeons to paint the tissue of the brain, which in turn allows them to highlight the cancerous tissue, because there's more fluorescent probe on the cancerous tissue than non-cancerous, which is important because for brain cancers, the bad tissue by eye, or even using a microscope, is virtually impossible to distinguish from the good tissue. 
So the surgeons aren't sure normally if they've cut too little and cancer remains, or if they've cut too much and removed healthy, good tissue. So being able to discriminate between these two types of tissue is of gargantuan importance and cannot be overstated. Part nine, jellyfish. Jellyfish and their relatives, such as sea anemones, are within the broader clade called the Cnidaria. The Cnidarians collectively represent the oldest venomous lineage at about 700 million years old. But we know the least about these venoms of any other major group of venomous animals, despite their huge medical importance and the number of people being stung each year. And this is because the venom is a total nightmare to work with. It's basically extremely unstable snot. As my lab and others have found, the only thing worse than working on fish venom is working on jellyfish venom. Consequently, this results in more papers published on any given year on snake venoms than have ever been published altogether on jellyfish venoms. Jellyfish and other cnidarians sting through the use of specialized cells called nematocysts. As nematocysts may be distributed on all parts of the jellyfish and arranged in specific patterns, on the skin of the envenomed patient, they may in turn produce characteristic patterns, which may be helpful in identifying which species stung that particular victim. Irukandji jellyfish, for example, make little circular marks because most of their nematocysts are on the bell, while box jellyfish that they live alongside of leave marks like the person has been lashed with a bullwhip because most of their nematocysts are on their characteristically very long tentacles. The Nidaria are broken up into four different groups, the Anthozoa, Hydrozoa, Scyphozoa, and Cubozoa. Anthozoa are Nidarians such as anemones, hard and soft corals, and sea whips. Most of these just produce local pain. Some, however, are potentially dangerous, such as the appropriately named Hellfire sea anemone. The Hydrozoa includes the infamous fire coral, which is not lethal, but is extraordinarily painful, as I found out when scraping against one while scuba diving off of Komodo Island. The most important of the hydrozoa is the Portuguese man of war, which is a larger relative of the Australian blue bottle, the stings of which can produce painful and difficult breathing, back pain, and muscular cramps, which, while not likely to be directly lethal, if a swimmer is offshore and gets stung, that they could really struggle to get back ashore and therefore there's a risk of drowning. Moving on to the Scyphozoa. These are your true jellyfish, the ones that look like a fried egg with a bunch of thick tentacles underneath. Now, while the stings of most of these are just a bucket full of saltwater hell, some are potentially lethal, such as Nemora's jellyfish. The related species to the Nemora is the lion's mane jellyfish that is a bit less toxic, but is much larger. It's the most massive of all the jellyfish. It's also a great illustration of how with the combination of overfishing to remove the predators that eat the small jellies and climate change warming the waters and allowing the jellies to grow faster, that this one-two punch can have huge ecological impacts. So in the case of the lion's mane, that they've exploded in numbers around Japan, which results in fouling fishing nets and getting sucked into boat intakes. Finally, we're on to the cubozoa. These are the truly dangerous species, particularly the irukandji and the box jellyfish. They're also the hardest to see in the water, being almost perfectly clear, and then, as a result, just about invisible. There's some suggestion that with warming seawaters that the lethal cubozo and jellyfish are expanding their ranges. The irukandji, as I mentioned, have their stinging cells arranged on the bell, and they only have very short tentacles. This is because they hang out around the uh, coral reef area when they're offshore. So as a result, when they sting, they leave a characteristic circular mark at the sting site. Now, even though they're small, they're still lethal. There's typically a delay of 30 to 50 minutes for the symptoms, which then include extreme lower back pain, muscle cramping, nausea, vomiting, headache, acute pulmonary edema, extremely high blood pressure, and then there's something that's been reported independently by different patients, and it's a 
very unique and enigmatic psychological effect where the patients, in virtually the same words, describe it as an impending feeling of doom. Symptoms can last up to two weeks, so it's true hell. There's no proven treatment. The doctors mostly try to treat the symptoms. It doesn't respond well to morphine, so a combination of like diazepam and ketamine is something that I've spoken to some doctors who have had good success about helping to settle the patients down so they can just ride out the effects. As far as the cardiovascular effects, they either survive it or they don't. Moving on, the most dangerous of all the jellyfish, the box jellyfish, Chironax flecheri. This large jellyfish is found off the coast of northern Australia and then northwards towards the equator from there. On average, it's responsible for a death a year. Now, it only takes about two meters of total contact for the tentacles to kill a person. The jellies have 60 tentacles, which are 15 to a group and arranged in four groups. The tentacles may be up to four meters long. So this gives them a collective up to 240 meters of tentacle, which, if it only takes two meters of total contact, is enough venom to kill 120 people, making it arguably the most venomous animal out there. But not a lot of deaths have occurred, which is why it's not in our number 10. Death, however, may result in one of two ways. First off, like the stonefish, the pain is so intense that the person is overwhelmed and dies from shock, dying in as quick as a few minutes. If they survive that, then the venom in about a half hour later can directly cause lethal cardiovascular collapse. Now, the initial first aid consists of using vinegar to wash off any tentacles still stuck to the body. Now, importantly, this has no effect on venom that's already been injected. What it does, though, is keep things from getting worse because it neutralizes the stinging cells that haven't fired already and therefore prevents further venom from being injected as the tentacles tumble down the leg while being washed off. Versus if you use seawater to wash them off as they roll down the leg, you're going to get more and more stings occurring and things are going to get much worse. There is an antivenom made in Australia, so there's a good treatment option. That's always comforting. Now, as I mentioned, you know, that while the box jellyfish may be able to potentially deliver more lethal doses than any other kind of venomous animal, deaths are comparatively rare, with only about 70 people killed in Australia over the last century. Now, this is due to Australians sensibly staying out of the water during box jellyfish season or swimming only in the areas with protective nets, both of which are good strategies to avoid also being eaten by a shark. All right, number 10, snakes. Within snakes, the venom system has undergone extraordinary changes, including syringe-like hollow fangs evolving on three separate occasions. Now, there's far too much coolness to go into now, but there will be a future episode focusing just on the evolution of the snake venom system and multiple episodes on different venomous snakes from across the world. So check back. But for the purpose of this episode, we're working on trying to determine what is the most dangerously venomous snake out there. The Inland Taipan is reputed to have the world's most toxic snake venom. But it's a good example of how that sort of ranking doesn't mean much in the real world. This large snake is a specialist for the baking heat of the Channel Country deep in outback Australia. Like the related coastal Taipan, it's a specialist on dangerous types of native mammals that would normally be able to severely injure or kill a snake. So taipans have evolved under extraordinary selection pressure to produce large amounts of extremely potent venom in order to overwhelm their prey before it has a chance to retaliate and injure or kill the snake. The estimated human lethal dose of the inland taipan is about one milligram of venom and these snakes are capable of delivering up to 100 milligrams. In contrast, the coastal taipan is a bit less toxic with the estimated human lethal dose of about two milligrams, but these snakes are capable of delivering over 500 milligrams of venom. So while the inland taipan is a bit more toxic, the coastal taipan delivers proportionally 
more lethal doses per bite because of its proportionally larger venom yield. Also, despite being arguably the world's most toxic snake, there are no confirmed deaths on record for the inland taipan. And this is due to the remoteness of its native range. You know, they live in the middle of nowhere. Most bites have occurred from snakes in captivity, with victims therefore able to rapidly receive proper medical care. In contrast, there is an abundance of deaths on record for the coastal taipan, particularly for the population that lives in Papua New Guinea. However, even if we lump all the taipan deaths up together, these insanely toxic snakes still don't make it very far up the list. In Australia, snake bites are quite rare, and deaths even rarer. About one to two people die each year. The coastal taipan, however, is much more of an issue in Papua New Guinea, and snake bite in general is more of an issue. But even in Papua New Guinea, the number of deaths from the coastal taipan, or you know, all other snakes lumped together, is still much less than the average impact elsewhere in the world. So the annual impact in PNG is still probably less than one or two weeks worth of cobra bites in India. And India is a good example of somewhere with a real snake bite problem. And in India, snake bites are overwhelmingly accounted for by the big four species, the blue krite, the Russell's viper, the soil scaled viper, and the spectacled cobra. Collectively, these snakes are estimated to be responsible for up to 1 million snake bites a year in India alone. Of these, about 50 to 100,000 result in deaths, but the real socioeconomic impact is in the survivors, with about 400,000 people a year having permanent injury ranging from destroyed kidneys through to amputation. And of those four species, the standout is the saw scale viper. And this is because it's not just abundant in India, but it's abundant across the Middle East and down into Africa. So saw scale vipers, taking into account their toxicity, the number of bites and deaths, anti-venom issues, which we'll get into a little bit later, all of that added up together, saw scale vipers as a type are arguably the most dangerously kind of venomous snake, not just in that region, but in the, the entire world. So despite their relatively small size, their impact is huge. Sawscale vipers were once thought to be a single wide-ranging species, but this group is a collection of several highly similar looking species. And collectively, they're responsible for more snake bite deaths than any other type of snake. This is due to a combination of factors, including a very fast acting venom that absolutely nukes the blood coagulation, it occurs in high densities in disturbed habitats, such as absolutely thriving in rural farmland. And then it's also biting pe people who are some of the most impoverished in the world, and therefore the least able to afford treatment. You know, re you know, emphasizing the fact that snake bite is really a condition of poverty, where the people hit the hardest can afford it the least. And perhaps most importantly, even if people are able to reach antivenom and afford it, there's big issues with the antivenoms where the antivenom made against one species or even one region of a species may not react well against another region of that same species or a closely related snake. So this is because that while all, all the soil scale vipers produce the same effect on blood using the same kind of toxins acting in the same way, Subtle changes on the molecular surface of the toxins impacts how well an antibody molecule that makes up an antivenom is going to recognize it. Much like how flu vaccines made against one strain may perform poorly against a different strain of flu. So this makes treatment hard enough even when the right antivenom is used, but there's a truly tragic situation going on and that it comes down to the fact that in Africa, there's two excellent antivenoms made specifically to treat bites by African saw scale vipers. One made by ICP that's very selective for West African saw scale vipers, and the other made by the South Africans that is made using a two to one ratio of East versus West South African vipers. So 
While it performs best against East, it still does a great job against West African soul-scale vipers. So the South African antivenom very much is a Pan-African soul-scale viper antivenom. However, Indian antivenom manufacturers who make antivenoms that work quite well in India have started selling their antivenoms in Africa as cheaper alternatives. But the problem is, is that they've been selling it without doing any preclinical testing. And deaths have skyrocketed in the hospitals that have switched over up to a 20-fold increase. And these clinical observations were reported, but the antivenom manufacturers did nothing. So my lab undertook testing and the results were quite shocking. There was a total and absolute failure of the Indian antivenoms against African soul-scale viper venoms, despite working well against Indian ones. Um, however, you know, the Indian antivenoms actually failed against one of the types of soul-scale vipers found within India itself. So they performed well against one kind of Indian soul-scale viper, but failed against another. So they performed well with the type that is shared with Pakistan, but failed against a North Indian type of saw scaled, which is unsurprising since the antivenom is made in India using venom that's collected from one geographic source all around the Chennai region. This is because herpetology icon Ron Whitaker, in collaboration with the Urula snake tribe, collects venom from that region to supply the Indian antivenom manufacturers. So consequently, India has a problem even within India, let alone in Africa. We sent them our results before we published, but they really didn't care. And despite a follow-up study by the Liverpool of Tropical Medicine showing congruent results, they're continuing to sell antivenoms in Africa. To sell a life-saving product without doing due diligence preclinical testing to show that it works results in a situation that may be at best negligent. But to continue selling it, despite having seen data showing it doesn't work, is, in my opinion, murder. And it you know, underscores the predatory practices that happen all across the developing world, where, depressingly, this thing with the antivenom is not unique. It's symptomatic of a much more fundamental problem that we will go into in more depth in a future episode on biomedical scandals, so keep an eye on for that. Moving on, things are not all doom and gloom, however, when it comes to saw scale vipers. As with many other venomous animals, a life-saving drug has been developed from this kind of venom, in this particular case to treat heart conditions such as angina. This, of course, just underscores what I've been saying all along, that these animals have value whether or not you care about nature. Like, you know, I love nature, but you know, I am cognizant to the fact that other people aren't. So. When I'm lecturing at the university, I often have students ask me, what is the strongest conservation message? And I invariably respond that the weakest message is when somebody talks about how beautiful it is to go wandering through the rainforest or magical to go diving on the barrier reef. You know, sentiments I, of course, wholeheartedly agree with, but these are emotional arguments. You know, they're only going to appeal to people who feel the same way. You're preaching to the choir. So the only argument that will stop people who don't care about nature from cutting down all the trees and putting up a parking lot is an economic argument, that you need to have conservation through commercialization. To drive home the fact that, in addition to just being generally awesome, nature is incalculably valuable as a source of life-saving medication. For example, if you know of anybody taking high blood pressure medication, Odds are they're taking captopril or one of its derivatives. This was developed back in 1976, so 46 years ago, from the venom of the lance-headed pit viper. And it's been one of the top 20 drugs of all time. Captopril is a blockbuster treatment for high blood pressure. And it's been up there with aspirin as far as its medical importance, and it remains today a $10 billion a year market. It's an absolute wonder drug whose importance cannot be overstated. Yet it was developed from a venomous snake, one of the most reviled creatures, where people say the only good snake is a dead snake. Well, actually the only good snake is a live snake because you can't get life-saving drugs that might save your grandmother's life or make you millions of dollars 
from a dead snake. So this concludes the top 10 most venomous animal series. We'll be going into venomous animals repeatedly in different episodes. So if there's particular aspects that you'd like covered in a future episode, please, by all means, put it in the comment section and I'll make sure to address it in a future episode. I know this was a lengthy episode, but there's just so much coolness to go through and I could have gone on for hours. So future episodes will dive deeper into each group of venomous animals, such as dangerously venomous snakes from different particular regions of the world. And there certainly are different ways to consider which animals could be named as the most dangerously venomous. And, you know, if you have an animal in your region that's particularly prevalent or feared that you'd like, you know, it covered in an episode, please, you know, put it in the comment section and I'll research it for a video. So thank you very much and stay tuned. Mm -hmm.